Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Swayam Prabha. This is Dr. Sumiti Ahuja. I am Assistant Professor, Faculty of Law, University of Delhi and I am taking your course on Law of Contracts. Today in our first session, I will be taking up the topic General Introduction, History and Nature of Contractual Obligations. To start with, I would first like to introduce to you the concept of contract itself. As you can see on the screen, it means or it is generally meant to be bilateral transaction. Contract is generally a bilateral transaction which means that both the sides or both the parties under a contract do something for each other. Either give money or as, as in, in the monetary form or provide services, sell goods, so on and so forth. So it is a two way process. But uh, you will see that the Indian Contract Act provides for certain exceptions wherein even unilateral transactions have been held to be valid contracts. But that will be covered in our later sessions. Secondly, I would like to introduce to you the concept of contractual obligations. As the name itself suggests, the term contractual obligations means the obligations under the contract or terms of the contract that is the conditions, the terms, the obligations which the parties have agreed upon. We are aware that first thing when we teach our students as to what is the difference between tort and breach of contract, first thing we tell them is that tort is something wherein duties are primarily fixed by law. Whereas in case of contract, duties are primarily fixed by parties. As you can see, I have in, in the last line of this uh, slide, it says these should be within the bounds of law. Yes, agreed that although in case of a contract, the duties are primarily fixed by the parties. Parties determine, both the parties with mutual consent determine as to what would be the terms of the contract or the obligations which they will have to fulfill. But at the same time, they have to be careful that those obligations or those duties which have to be performed, those terms which have to be fulfilled are legal in nature, are within the bounds of law. For example, paying a sharpshooter to kill somebody is not a valid contract. Reason being, maybe yes, the duties have been fixed by the parties, but they are not bound within the, uh, they are not bound by the law or they are not within the terms of law. They are illegal in nature. The next concept which I would like to introduce to you here is freedom of contract as the name itself suggests freedom. So when two parties are entering into a contract, it is out of their own free consent, their free will voluntarily they decide to enter into a contract and abide by the obligations, abide by the duties, abide by the uh, uh, responsibilities they have to fulfill under the contract. Now, consider a situation that X, who is the employer in a particular organization, he has a right to freely contract with any of his employees who join that organization, but action may be taken against him if he breaks any law. As you can see on the slide, it has been written that consider, for example, there is some law which fixes the number of hours, uh, work hours for the employees. Whereas, now in case of the contract which he has entered into bit, uh, with his uh, employees, he inserts or incorporates a condition therein or say for example, he makes them work for 12 hours in a day. Whereas, according to the law which has been laid down by the government, the maximum number of hours is 8. So, in that case, Although duties have been fixed by parties, but they are not within the bounds of law. 
right and secondly you are imposing that condition on your employee right so one can't say that yes being an employer you have a, you have exercised your freedom to enter into a contract with your employee but has that same freedom been exercised by that employee of yours because that contract itself mentioned that he has to work for these many number of hours does he have any say in that situation the answer is no so that's a thing which has to be taken into consideration here now the next concept after freedom of contract which i have mentioned here is standard form contracts standard form contracts is something which we all are aware of but we don't know what it is exactly standard form as the name itself suggests it's a standard criteria for example if two parties are entering into a contract the general rule under the law of contracts is that both the parties with mutual agreement decide upon the terms of the contract now standard form contract says that the terms or the conditions of that contract are predetermined or they are predecided by one of the parties and the other party has the option of either taking it or leaving it in the sense that you have the option of accepting those conditions as it is or you may reject those conditions and do not enter into a contract so yes you have that much freedom to choose whether you wish to accept those predetermined conditions or reject them but you do not have you are not left with any say to uh, negotiate upon the terms because see contract if we say contract is something wherein the terms are decided by the parties on the basis of mutual agreement mutual consent now in a situation wherein the terms have been predetermined or predecided in such a situation there is no power of negotiation left with the other party and uh, there is no say right so but yes this much freedom is there at least that he may accept it or leave it now if i may tell you about certain examples for standard form of contract right now for example you purchase a builder's flat right a build a, a builder constructed flat right now have you negotiated or will you negotiate with that builder that these should be the terms of that contract then only i'll be entering into contract with you then only i'll purchase your uh, uh, property otherwise no thank you very much there are other in line right it's not like that conditions are there in existence you accept it and you go on go ahead with it now i would like to add a rider here that say for example in that particular contract fine you uh, when you uh, read that contract as a lay person as a normal common uh, person you did not find any problem with those terms uh, in that contract and you agreed you sign you have put your signature you entered into that contract even though it's a standard form of contract but still you agreed you entered into it but what if at a later stage there is some dispute which has arisen between uh, you and that builder say in relation to possession of the property that in that contract it was written that as soon as the builder completes the construction of the flat the possession will be handed over to you now say for example a uh, few years have passed and the construction is not yet complete and there is no sign of completion also and uh, obviously you have not got the possession now in such a case after waiting for years after having spent your uh, spent a fortune on purchasing that property you're not getting the possession of the property now as you can see on the screen i have written here now in that situation what will be the status of legal remedy there is a simple thing which you have to understand if there is a contract two parties have entered into a contract if either of the party decides not to fulfill or fails to fulfill any of the terms of that contract then in such a situation what is the remedy available with the other party the remedy is that person can 
exercise his or her right and approach the court and claim the legal remedy now here is the situation standard form of contract you have read the terms of the contract and you have entered into the contract yes you did not negotiate upon the terms but you did enter into the contract after going through the terms now do you still have any kind of legal remedy left with you can you go to the court the answer is yes you can still go because the example which i am giving you is not very uh, some unprecedented case but yes these thing this kind of situation keeps on happening in such kind of situation the court will consider the fact whether that term which had been incorporated into the contract was of reasonable nature or not if it was of a reason reasonable nature then in that case the party who has approached the court may not get relief but as i just told you that in the example the uh, term which had been or the clause which had been incorporated in the contract it mentioned that the possession will be given as soon as the construction is over there is no time period mentioned right so that means it cannot be till infinity so in that case yes the aggrieved party will get remedy will get legal remedy so here i would like to tell you what do we mean by an aggrieved party aggrieved party uh, is a term which is used to refer to a person whose legal right has been infringed whose legal right has been uh, breached by the other party and in order to claim remedy because of that uh, infringement of the right the person is going to the court so that person is the aggrieved party agree means the party whose right has been affected by the action of others now two interesting points here i would like to make first of them being when we talk about contract generally for a lay person a contract is something which has to be in written form there is a piece of paper there is a written document which has various terms incorporated in it and uh, after reading it both the parties are going to sign it and that's how they'll enter into that contract right but nowhere in the indian contract act it has been written barring few exceptions that we'll be dealing at a later stage in our other sessions barring few exceptions there is no mandate that a contract has to be in written contract can even be oral in nature for example you go to any shop in your uh, uh, near your in your society itself and you purchase something you ask for something you tell the person you tell the shopkeeper that this is something which you need and in return he tells you that okay fine take this thing and this is the amount which you have to give and you end up giving that amount even that is a contract it's oral in nature and you both are not telling each other that fine i am making you this offer are you accepting the offer do you wish to enter into a contract with me no it's oral in nature and uh, you have uh, offered to purchase something if the person i mean you, you have uh, told that person you have uh, showed your intention to that person that there is a specific thing which you wish to buy and if that person if it is in stock if it is uh, still within the expiry date the person will hand over that thing to you and you will be under an obligation in return to pay for that particular thing which you have purchased so apart from the fact that uh, contract uh, need not necessarily be in written form it can mean oral uh, format also one more thing i would like to highlight here which i have written that contract can also be express and implied or if i may say express or implied now if i may distinguish between these two terms for you when i say express express means by words it can be in written format it can be verbal also right so i may say that i am making you this offer are you interested in accepting this offer right so that's express you are sharing your intention you are communicating your intention to enter into a contract with the other person through words so that is express it can be in written it can be oral as i said the next term which you can see on the screen is uh, the contract can also be implied in nature express as i said is words implied means conduct 
So, for example, you go to a restaurant. You have, uh, it's a casual dining restaurant. You went with your friends or with your family. You got the menu card. You chose what you wanted to have and you placed the order. The order came and uh, now you have decided that fine, let's eat it. It's good. And after you have finished your meal, what is the next thing you do? Do you leave the restaurant just like that? No. The answer is you ask for the bill and you pay for it. So that is implied in nature. It's an implied contract. That is your conduct of uh, ordering the food after having a look at the menu is an implied promise from your side that see if I'll get this thing and if I'm consuming this thing, I'll be paying for it. So that's implied in nature. If I may just briefly now take you to the uh, structure of the Indian Contract Act. As you can see on the screen, it says the Indian Contract Act can be divided into two parts. Although I may say four parts. First part as is written on the screen, sections 1 to 75 of the Indian Contract Act 1872 deal with the first part of the contract act which is general principles of the contract. So this course of ours or this uh, course which I am taking for you law of contract herein I am dealing with the general principles of contract. So we will be covering these uh, this first part of the Indian contract act which is the general principles and the second part as the screen is telling you it is represented by sections 124 to 238 which provides for special contracts like bailment, guarantee, indemnity, etc. Agency. Now, I just mentioned few seconds ago, I suppose, that although it is said that the Indian Contract Act can be divided into two parts, first part refers to the general principle, the second part refers to the uh, special contracts. But there are two more parts. Yes, they are not of relevance, reason being that they have been repealed. So as you can see that section 76 to 123 and 239 to 266 have been repealed from the Indian Contract Act. Now what do we mean by repealed? Repealed means that they have been removed from the Indian Contract Act. They are no more part of the Indian Contract Act. They are no more studied as a part of the Indian Contract Act 1872. You will open the Act, you will open the Bear Act, the statute book titled Indian Contract Act 1872 and when you will glance through these sections which I just told you about, those which have been repealed, you will see that for section 76 to 123, it has been mentioned that now it is part of, it was dealing with sale of goods. I would like to tell you here that yes, we do have uh, an act now which is Sale of Goods Act. So these provisions were repealed from the Indian Contract Act and they were, they formed the part of the Sale of Goods Act because the Sale of Goods Act came later than the Indian Contract Act. Similar is the case where 239 to 266, they were dealing with partnership and then later on the Indian Partnership Act came into being and these provisions were repealed from the Indian Contract Act and were incorporated in the new law. I have mentioned here that the Indian Contract Act is one of those few acts wherein hardly any amendments have taken place. Now I would like to tell you briefly difference between amendment and repeal here. Although it is not uh, part of the law of contract, but you will see that in the Bear Act, these terms are used every now and then, amendment, repeal, right? So, um, uh, repealed, I just told you that they are removed from the Indian contract. They have been removed from the Indian Contract Act or if any provision is removed from the written law, it is said to be repealed. That is, it is no more part of that law. When we say amendment, Amendment means modification. That means you are not removing that provision or that part from that uh, law in toto or in totality, but you are making changes in it. That is what we mean by amendment. So I just made a point that Indian Contract Act is one of those few acts wherein very few amendments have been 
taken place. Now, the next thing as I just said that uh, I would in this on this particular screen you can see that I am giving you the outline of the Indian Contract Act, the basic. So, if I am giving you the basic, I obviously will have to start with the section number 1. I cannot uh, forget section 1 of the Indian Contract Act. In fact, for that matter, uh, any written law you study, you will see that section 1 of the Act generally is dealing with short title, the extent and the commencement of that particular Act. So, what do we mean by short title? If I have a name which I just told you in the beginning, Sumiti Ahuja. So, that is the name which is used for my identification. Similarly, short title of any act is the name by which we recognize that particular law. So, when we say Indian Contract Act 1872, that is the short title of the Indian Contract Act 1872. And uh, section 1 as I said, apart from dealing with short title, also deals with extent and commencement. Now, what do we mean by extent? Extent means the application or the applicability of that particular law. So, is it applicable to the whole of India? Is it applicable to a particular state? Is it applicable to a particular organization? So, our Indian Contract Act is a central legislation. It is applicable to the whole of the territory of India. And uh, when we talk about commencement, commencement is the day when the law had come into force. You can see on the screen here that two different dates have been mentioned. One is April 25, 1872, the other date is September 1, 1872. When you will open the act, the first page of the act itself from where the sections, the provisions start, you will see that on the right corner top corner of the uh, uh, that particular page under the title of the act, you will see the date April 25, 1872 is written. And that is the date on which that law had received the assent of the president of India. And there is this another date which is referred in the section number 1 of the Indian Contract Act, which is September 1, 1872. So, what do, what do, we, uh, what do we understand from that or what do I mean? when I am uh, specifically incorporating this point in your uh, slide, in your presentation here. It means that although this law had received presidential assent on April 25, 1872, it came into force or it commenced from September 1, 1872. So, that is what commencement means, the law actually coming into force. It can come uh, into force on the day it has received the assent of the president or of the uh, state head as the case may be or it may the date uh, of coming into force can be deferred also as you can see for yourself here. Next thing I have highlighted here as you can see is that Indian Contract Act is one of the country's, country's earliest mercantile laws. That we all can understand because uh, you know that the year on which year in which this law came into force is 1872. So the law, uh, the basic function, the basic purpose, or the object, if I may say, of the Indian Contract Act is that it is one of those laws which establishes criteria. I won't say one of those laws actually. It is the law which establishes criteria for formation and compliance of contracts in a regulated and organized manner. What do I mean by saying that it is uh, done in a regulated and organized manner? If you will go through the provisions of the Indian Contract Act, you will see the manner in which the contract, the provisions have been listed or have been uh, systematically written. It starts with telling you about the definitions of the various important terms. Then it moves on to uh, telling you about uh, how communication is important in uh, for entering into a particular contract and certain other things. Then moving on to the part that what are the essential requirements of a valid contract that is your section number 10, the most important provision for uh, the Indian Contract Act. Then it proceeds to explaining 
or you can say defining the various essentials as mentioned under section 10. Thereafter, you move on to the concept of performance of the contract. That is fine. Once the contract has been entered into, how would you discharge that contract? What if breach of the contract is committed? What is breach? Right. So, all these things have been mentioned and including impossibility of performance. When we entered into contract, it was very well performable. But now it has become non-performable. Maybe because uh, the theatre in which I was to perform, that theatre has uh, caught fire, there was a short circuit, the theatre is all destroyed. Can I still perform on the designated day? The answer is no. The reason is it has become impossible to perform. Right. Now, and uh, after performance, then thereafter, you will see the provisions are dealing with the remedy, the damages. Right. So, that is how systematically uh, arranged the provisions of the Indian Contract Act 1872 are. Now, this interesting thing here, which is in existence in uh, many laws, in your, if you have heard about the uh, Competition Act, Indian Competition Act. So, before Competition Act, there was a law in existence, if you could, uh, if you have heard about it, MRTP Act, right. MRTP Act was repealed and its uh, place was taken by Competition Act, right. So, now Savings Clause was mentioned in uh, Competition Act also like it is mentioned here in the Indian Contract Act. What do we mean by Savings Clause? Savings Clause in general means that say for example, if there are certain decisions which have already been taken before this law came into picture or uh, some rights, liabilities which have been defined earlier than this law coming into picture or as it says here, if I may just read for you, nothing herein contained shall affect the provisions of any statute, act or regulation not hereby expressly repealed nor any usage or custom of trade nor any incident of any contract not inconsistent with the provisions of this act. Now, this inconsistent is most important part. Savings clause means, fine, I have replaced the previous one, but I am not touching upon the previously existing thing, because it simply means that, uh, fine, that when that law was in existence, it has played its part, played uh, its part. Now, I have come into existence, I will be playing my part and I would not be touching upon that uh, previously existing law. It has done what it had to do. When we talk about savings clause in terms of the Indian Contract Act, we have to understand that it is trying to tell you that if there is in existence any other law which deals with any type of contract, or if we refer to any customary uh, trade practices which are which were in existence when this law came into picture unless and until they are inconsistent they are uh, contradictory to any of the provisions of the indian contract act they are not to be affected they are not to be removed they are not to be uh, uh, declared uh, to be no more functional after this law has come into picture. So, it simply means that fine, they will also live, I will also live because they are not treading on my paths nor will I tread on their paths, right. So, because the Indian Contract Act is a general uh, act dealing with contracts, we have other laws for example, Transfer of Property Act is there. So, that is dealing with the certain specific aspect of uh, contract, right. Now, I will move on to the history part of the Indian Contract Act. I know history is boring, I also uh, understand that thing, but before we start or we get into depth of any particular law, we have to understand, we have to appreciate that what, what happened or what led to the coming into force of a particular law. As I have mentioned here, uh, you can see on the screen that the act was passed during the British rule in India because you can see it came in 1872. So, it was uh, passed by the British, uh, passed during the British rule in India and it is mainly based on the principles of 
English common law. Now, I'll make one important point for you here that in Indian Contract Act, you will see that many principles which have been incorporated in the Indian Contract Act, those provisions have been taken from the English principles, English legal principles which saw their origin in English common law, that is the judicial precedents, right? And yes, certain customary trade practices, these things were also incorporated, no doubt, and some other laws which were there in existence. But mostly, most of it, as I have written here, it is mainly based on the principles of English common law. And again, one of the most important pieces of legislation ever produced by Britishers, why are we saying it is one of the most important pieces of legislation? Reason being, as I had told you in the beginning itself, it is one of those laws in India which has hardly seen any amendments. Very few amendments or uh, repeal uh, basically have taken place in this act. Repeal to me, I mean, I, I would say amendments. Very few amendments have taken place, right? So, that is also one of the reasons which makes this law uh, an important piece of legislation which was uh, produced by Britishers or if I may say it was produced during the British era and the principles enacted therein are codification of the basic principles guiding transactional relationships which is why it has had few amendments. So, I will focus on this part codification of the basic principles guiding transactional relationships. So, this uh, the contractual relation between the two parties is what we are referring to here when we say transactional relationships. Transaction means this only. You are doing something for someone, someone else is doing something for you in return. That is a transactional uh, relationship, a contractual relationship which I am trying to tell you. And codification we mean that these principles like we said uh, it is mainly based on principles of English common law. So, those principles have been and customary uh, trade practices etc. they have been brought together and they have been codified that means they have been uh, produced into a written law. Before the Indian Contract Act was enacted the contractual relationship was governed by personal laws of different religious communities like different laws for Hindus and Muslims. Before we proceed to the next slide or before we proceed to the next part of the presentation, I would just like to make a point here that you will see in the, in the presentation further that there were various periods like for example, Vedic and medieval period was there, Roman period was there, Islamic period, Hindu period, then finally came the British period when we got this 1872 Indian Law Contract Act in place. So, if we just uh, start with the evolution of contract law. So, the first period we would be discussing here or I would like to highlight here is the Vedic and medieval period. So, it says the principles were derived from multiple references, notably the Vedas, Dharma Shastras, Smritis and Shrutis and these provided a vivid depiction of the law similar to contracts in those times. In those times, we did not have any Indian Contract Act in place, but the main source of law were all these, these uh, references we have referred here, these references from the Hindu law. Now, if I would just uh, highlight the contribution of the Roman period in the evolution of contract law here, I would like to make a point that in early Rome, the law of contracts evolved by recognizing a multitude of categories of promises to be enforced rather than developing any universal criteria for enforcing promises. Thus, Roman law pioneered the idea that a promise may result in an enforceable duty. Whenever we teach jurisprudence to our students, there is a concept which we uh, teach them which is Hoffieldian analysis, Hoffieldian analysis of right duty. 
So therein we say that rights and duties are correlatives, which means if one person has a right, the other person in return has a duty to not infringe that particular right. Fine. So as we have highlighted here that Roman law pioneered this idea that a promise may result in an enforceable duty because the other person has a right that whatever you are promising to that person, that promise has to be fulfilled. Because if it is not fulfilled, the right of that person will be affected. Islamic period is the next which I would like to highlight here. So it says during Muslim control, uh, Muslim control or Muslim rule in India, all contract related issues were governed by Mamdan law. So the Arabic word for contract is akad, which means conjunction. And it represents the confluence of proposal, ijab and acceptance that is kabul. Kabul means to accept. So the formation of contract according to Islamic law does not require any kind of formality. The only requirement is that the express consent of both the parties, the proposal and acceptance must be made of the same thing in the same sense. When we say same thing and the same sense and uh, consent of both the parties, I would like to draw, so I, I would like to take you to certain uh, components of the Indian Contract Act. First of all, to start with, when I say con same thing in the same sense, it means consensus at Edom. Not a term which was recognized at that time, but whenever we teach our students about the fact that when two parties are entering into a contract and they enter into such a contract with mutual consent and uh, they agree on all the terms of the contract in the same on the same thing in the same sense. So that is what we mean by consensus ad edem. That is same both the parties agree upon the same thing in the same sense. So consensus ad edem. Apart from that, yes, uh, the, the, it, I won't say that the only requirement under our Indian Contract Act as it stands now is uh, that the express consent of both the parties is to be there and proposal and acceptance. We have much more, uh, much more in the Indian Contract Act as it stands now uh, than this because it says that apart from the fact that uh, there has to be free consent, voluntary consent uh, given by the parties. Uh, apart from that, yes, proposal acceptance that is uh, the form that leads to formation of an agreement. The next thing, which is also the, the one of the other important things which is also mentioned there is that the parties should be competent to and legally competent to enter into a contract. Whenever we say legally competent to enter into a contract, we are trying to say that person is neither a minor nor is a person uh, uh, mentally incapable to enter into contract or nor is the person disqualified under any law in existence to enter into any particular contract. So these are the things. Uh, and obviously there are certain other requirements also like there has to be a lawful consideration, there has to be lawful object etc etc which we will be touching upon later. But what I would like, what I was trying to convey to you is that the Indian Contract Act or validity of a contract under Indian Contract Act is not restricted to the point that uh, only the consent is required and uh, proposal acceptance is there and same thing same sense. There are other things also, competency, legal competency is also one of the uh, most important parts in our law. Now the Hindu period, so it says the jurisprudential part of Hindu law differs significantly from English law jurisprudence. Hindu law is the culmination of innumerable practices and works of Smriti Kars who interpreted and analyzed Vedas to develop the various aspects of Hindu law. Manu Smriti's contract law dealt with the incapacity to enter into a contract. This is what I was referring to you just 
in, in the previous uh, slide that the fact that uh, the Indian Contract Act as, it's now, as it now stands is also very clear of the fact that the two parties we, who are entering into that contract have to be legally competent. They have to be legally capable to enter into a contract. So it says here that uh, Manu Smriti's contract law dealt with the incapacity to enter into a contract. It established the notion which is also reflected in the Indian Contract Act that a contract entered into by a minor, an intoxicated person is not legitimate. Uh, the Indian Contract Act uh, is not mentioning the term that a person should not be a minor, person should not be an intoxicated person. But when we talk about section 10 of the Indian Contract Act, which uh, as I just told you talks about the essential requirements of a valid contract, it says that a uh, uh, person should have, I mean should be leg legally competent. Then after that under section 11 it says, what do we mean by competency, legally competent. So it says that person has, person should be the one who has attained the age of majority. It is not saying person should not be a minor. It says person should have attained the age of majority and then it says the person should be of sound mind. It does not say intoxicated because when we say person should be of sound mind, unsoundness of mind is not restricted to intoxication only. It can be some medical uh, reason also which has say affected the mental uh, uh, capabilities of a particular person. Now coming to the British period, before the advent of the Indian Contract Act, the English law was applied in the presidency towns of Madras, Bombay and Calcutta under the charter of 1726 issued by King George to the East India Company. In the year uh, 1862, the introduction of the high courts took place in the town of Bombay, Calcutta and Madras and the charter of these high courts also contained the same provision as the previously existing law that the high courts were to apply personal laws of the respective religions before rendering any judgment in respect to the contract cases. So here we are referring to a situation to a time period wherein 1872 uh, Indian Contract Act had not come into force, right. So uh, at that time it was an obligation on the high courts to uh, apply the personal laws of the respective religions before rendering any judgment. Now uh, the Indian Contract Act is applied uh, today. It was drafted originally by the third Indian Law Commission in the year 1861 in England and uh, thereafter in 1872 we got the law as it stands today. Now I would like to just briefly give you an overview of the definitions, uh, uh, section number 2 of the Indian Contract Act because for our uh, following uh, sessions we will have to uh, go through, I mean the, the concepts uh, would require the understanding or the knowledge of the uh, definitions. So I will just give you a brief overview because we would be dealing with uh, these uh, definitions in detail. Uh, the definitions which have been given under or what we call as interpretation clause, section number 2 of the Indian Contract Act is what we refer to as or what we understand as interpretation clause. And for that matter, uh, most of the uh, written laws, most of the acts which we have in India, uh, section 2, section 3, section 2 or section 3 generally are dealing with the definition clause or interpretation clause. That is, if a particular word has been defined in that definition clause or interpretation clause, similar mean the same meaning, I won't say similar, same meaning has to be denoted to that word wherever it has been used in the entire remaining act. Now, uh, the various definitions which have been uh, covered under the section number 2 are dealing with uh, proposal or what we also call as offer which simply means that when you uh, communicate your intention to enter into a contract with another person to that person, that is what we call as a proposal. You are making a proposal or an offer to another person wherein you are 
clearly stating about your intention to that person or your interest to enter into the contract with that person. Then fine, now uh, proposal has been made, offer has been given, now what? Now the person to whom that offer was made, if that person is interested in entering into any kind of agreement with that person who gave him the offer, will communicate his or her intention to enter into that contract, so which we call as acceptance. So that proposal which was made uh, to that person, he has accepted it now. You will see that in both uh, the definitions of proposal and acceptance under the section 2, one common word has been uh, mentioned which I will just write here on the screen you can see, signifies that is the person making the proposal, the person to whom that proposal is made, uh, is, who is accepting the offer, both have to signify their intention or signify their assent thereto. The moment we use the term signify, the term signify means communicate. You will see in the following sessions that how important is in the following section rather, uh, session rather that how important is communication in the contract. Because if you have not communicated your acceptance to that person directly who gave you the offer, you can't say the offer has been accepted. I mean, right, uh, it would not be accepted because the person to whom you had made the offer, that person's duty is if he is willing to accept the offer to communicate that acceptance to you who had gave him that offer, right. So, communication is extremely important. Now, uh, the various other terms which have been uh, used are uh, agreement, then the term is promise, right. So, when that offer, that proposal is accepted, it becomes a promise, right. And when the two parties are uh, giving promise, making promises to each other and they are agreeing with each other to enter into some kind of uh, transaction, some kind of con relation, uh, that is an agreement. Now, one very, very important term is mentioned in your, uh, is defined in fact in your section 2 clause D, D for Delhi, D of the Indian Contract Act, that is consideration. Consideration. Simple meaning consideration means something in return, something in return, right? Or uh, in uh, laymanish language, we also say that uh, it is price for a promise. So, it is a price which you have to pay to the other person, right? Uh, in return of the promise which he is making to you. So, price obviously need not be monetary because see, consideration need not necessarily be money. Consideration even means providing services. I just said consideration means something in return. So, the person may make you an offer that he wishes to purchase your car which you were planning to sell. So, he, he is making that offer to you that he wishes to purchase your car in say uh, 3 lakhs, right? Second hand car, 3 lakhs, he is uh, uh, willing to purchase. So, he makes that offer to you. That 3 lakhs which he is uh, offering to you so, that amount which he is agreeing to pay to you, that amount is consideration from his side and uh, his offer is to purchase your car. Now, you are, you accept that offer and you are ready to uh, sell that car to him. So, for, from your side, that car which you are selling to him in return of the price which he is paying, so that car is the consideration from your side. So, you, you, you just saw that one person is uh, paying, the other person is uh, giving the uh, car, providing the car. So, there is no money being exchanged uh, between both the parties. One is paying money for the uh, product, for the thing which he is getting in return. So, both the things are consideration. Now, uh, we will be getting to this topic later because there is an entire session related to consideration because Therein I will be emphasizing on the aspect that moment you will see the definition of consideration under the Indian Contract Act Section 2 Clause D, you will realize that how lengthy that definition is. 
and it is not easy for any person who's reading it for the first time mind you when i was a student when i also read that definition in the first go everything went way above my head so it's very important to read that particular definition slowly carefully and basically when i teach my students i say we have to dissect that definition we have to dissect that definition because then only we'll be able to understand def that definition because it's very lengthy and it uh, it also tells you that consideration can be uh, uh, past consideration present future but we'll get on to those things later now the next important thing here i would like to highlight is the fact the point that uh, you need to understand that the definition of contract as provided under the indian contract act says an agreement enforceable by law is a contract i'll just mention this term here because i would like to emphasize on it enforceable moment i say enforceable what do we mean by enforceable an agreement enforceable by law is a contract what do we mean when we say uh, enforceable by law it simply means that if you are right at any stage gets any stage of that contract gets infringed or gets affected interrupted by the other side by the party then in that particular situation then in that particular case the uh, you have the right to go to the court you have the right to go to the court because see you have a you had that legal right and that legal right got affected got infringed got uh, interrupted by the other person and where there is a legal right there is a legal remedy i'll just uh, make you aware of this important legal maxim or important legal phrase as we say obi just be remedium simply meaning where there is a right there is a remedy but i always modify this particular uh, saying whenever i take up this topic in my class i say see yes it means uh, where there is a right there is a remedy but what we are actually trying to convey in legal language is where there is a legal right there is a legal remedy if you do not have a legal right you cannot go to the court of law and get uh, uh, that particular uh, right enforced for example in the beginning of this session i had given you example of a sharp shooter being hired by a person to kill someone now consider a situation that uh, that sharp shooter took money from you and uh, he did not do his job he did not uh, go and kill that person now tell i mean now just think in that situation he having taken money and not killing that uh, person now can the person who had given him that money go to the court and say that isne to paise le liye he took money from me and now he is not done uh, his work i need my money back can we do that the answer is no it is not enforceable what do we mean by not enforceable that means the promise which was made was not lawful in nature that that is uh, 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 fine i'll go and kill that person and you paying that person money for killing the other person now in such a situation you cannot go to the court and say that he took money but he didn't do his job right so one has to be very careful it is not enforceable right and uh, yes coming back to ubija sibi remedium if your legal right has been affected if say for example you have uh, uh, say for example you had gone to a showroom to purchase something and you have made the part payment you have made the uh, advance payment and uh, that thing is not delivered to you and the person in fact refuses that uh, nahi i did not sell anything to you right and uh, for that matter you do not have any option say you you paid by cash and uh, there is no cctv camera also nothing there is how would you prove that you have actually uh, placed that order you do not have any copy you've lost the copy of the bill right 
So just consider a situation wherein you don't have any evidence to prove that you had actually uh, purchased something from uh, that person, right? Now in that situation, what would you do? Do you have a legal right to go to the court and uh, claim the legal remedy? See, you have a legal right, right? Because you have paid advance payment. But here comes in the question of evidence. How would you prove that? How would you prove that, right? Because law is all about arguing in the court and supporting those arguments with the uh, with the help of evidence. If you do not have evidence, you can't uh, put up your case. So it was just an additional point which I tried to make, uh, which I was trying to make. But you only have to understand that a right is enforceable. That is a legal remedy for that right, which has been affected by the other party, can be claimed by the court. The court will grant you relief if there is uh, some uh, some weight in your uh, arguments which you are making, the evidence which you are uh, uh, placing in the court, right? And if it is not enforceable, the term which has been used is void agreement. That is that agreement will never become a contract. It will stay an agreement because one party offered, the other party accepted it. Two parties agreed with each other, but it, it will not become a contract, right? It is void in nature. So, I will uh, try to conclude by making this point, by making the, these two points that an agreement which is enforceable by law is a contract and, agree and an agreement which is not enforceable by law is void. That is, it can never transform into a valid contract. Thank you. Understanding oneself, understanding others, understanding society at large, understanding the nature, these are all driven by basic human curiosity. We would all love to understand why things happen, what happens, what is the final outcome, why certain things fail. These are all exercises that we perform in various domains of knowledge. Therefore, knowledge in various domains you would realize they are actually social artifacts. They have to be rooted into historical perspective, they have to be culturally salient and there would be socio-political reasons behind this. Whether you talk with respect to engineering sciences, whether you talk with respect to physical sciences, biological sciences, social sciences, that is the reason why humanities and social sciences should be understood by all of us. The knowledge that is segregated, that is divided with respect to areas, specializations, all of them needs to be understood in its context. And what provides the context? It is the social reality. How do you correlate knowledge in a given domain with the cultural reality, with the social reality? with the socio-political compulsions. Okay. How do you understand the law of nature okay, in its totality? And for doing that, you require the understanding of humanities and social sciences. Say for instance, if you are trying to understand the effect of a particular bacteria, a virus, any microbe, how it affects behavior, how it affects the organism, human being. You start looking at it from a pure biological point of view. If you are trying to look at a particular type of a wavelength, say for example, you are emphasizing on the understanding of the effect of radiation on human life. You are looking at things from a physical point of view. You are looking at the corresponding changes inside the body. You are looking at the physiological side of the uh, understanding of the information. 
you are trying to understand why despite knowing the risk that is inbuilt in the process, why is still human beings engage into it? You are looking at it from a pure behavioral point of view. Why society at large admire things which has full of risk? You are trying to understand things from a pure sociological point of view. Why people use particular uh, set of words to explain those experiences? You are trying to understand things from the linguistic point of view. So, there are whole lot of things and then finally, you try to combine all of them to say that what are the guiding principles in life? Then you say you are looking at life, you are looking at humanity from a pure philosophical point of view. And this is what social sciences courses provide you. They provide the context to you in which you would be finally positioning the understanding of the knowledge in any given domain. It could be engineering, it could be sciences, it could be medical sciences, it could be social sciences stuff, it could be humanities stuff. So, con contextualizing the knowledge is what humanities social science courses help you obtain.